When we think about um, why do kids bully, uh, it is a very, very complex phenomenon, right? But one framework that we've used over the years for decades that we've uh, borrowed from Bronfenbrenner is a social ecological perspective. And essentially, there's about 3,000 articles on bullying, so I'm not going to be able to summarize all of them, but I'll do that within just the next few minutes. The reality is, is that it's not a deterministic model, that individual uh, characteristics of children interact with um, their home environment, their peer influence, their school climate. So you can have a child that um, maybe has some anger issues, some attachment issues, um, and that would place them at risk for either being a victim or a perpetrator of bullying, but they might be in a home and where there's social emotional kind of training that goes on, there's positive interactions between siblings and parents that kind of buffers the display of those risk factors into bullying or victimization. At the same time, you could have a child that doesn't have you know, any individual characteristics, but they're in a home in which violence is modeled. They'll be more likely to be a bully at school. Uh, they actually may also be a victim at school if they're victimized by a sibling or they see domestic violence in the home. But again, they could have those kind of environmental kind of risk factors, but if they go into a school where the school is a welcoming and restorative place, then that actually may slow down those risk factors of displaying, you know, really leading to bullying perpetration or victimization. So really we have to think about the interactions between individual characteristics, family characteristics, peers. We do know um, as kids get to middle school, bullying is seen as more popular and so they're largely influenced by the peers. Really good kids may engage in bullying behaviors because that's the cool thing to do and they want to fit in. Um, but we also have to think about society in general. You know, When you turn on the TV, what are kids seeing? What are they exposed to? Are there role models, even within television and media, that are promoting some of these behaviors? Or are these media things really kind of restorative as well? So it's very, very complex. So one thing that I want to point out, so um, some of you may know the gold standard in social science research and other research is the meta-analytic study. If you don't know what a meta-analytic study is, essentially it is a summary of a body of literature that either tells us what are the associations among some variables and what's the strength of those associations, so maybe an effect size, or in prevention area, um, what works under what conditions. I want to show you this one meta-analysis by Cook and colleagues because it really highlights what we've been saying in the developmental literature. And what it says is when, and I'll just give you an example, and you can read the slide, but essentially when you ask elementary school kids, who are the kids in this classroom that engage in bullying behaviors, and you ask them, who do you want to be friends with, or who are you friends with, they name different people. So the kids that engage in bullying behavior in elementary school are not popular, no one really wants to be their friends, they're rejected. When you ask a middle school kid who bullies in your classroom or in your school, and who are you friends with, or who do you want to be friends with, they name the same kids. So in this meta-analysis, the association between kind of bullying and social status really is dependent on the age. Now the take-home message here is that what you're doing for programming in K through 5 has to be modified and adapted for the middle school context where the kids that are engaging in high rates of bullying are not socially rejected but actually have high social capital. And one idea is to take those leadership skills of those kids and see if you can, what we call public opinion leaders, find them and see if you can get them to change their behavior and there might be a contamination of pro-social behavior, one idea. So when we think about individual correlates, you'll see thousands of articles on the associations for perpetrators and victims, depression, delinquency, impulsivity, which is our executive function issues that kids have, really highly correlated with bullying perpetration. We do know that kids that are chronically victimized in middle school are starting to cope through um, using drugs and alcohol. And then we also just generally kids that engage in high rates of bullying, um, and even the bystanders around really just do not value pro-social behavior and almost have a sense of moral disengagement engagement. And so we've talked a lot recently about moral disengagement and how it is that good kids don't intervene to help a victim. And moral disengagement has kind of been invoked, if you will. Now, again, hundreds of articles on what we know about the school climate and the family. The best way to summarize this body of literature is to say a healthy family looks like a healthy school. An unhealthy family looks like an unhealthy school. And we do know that there are a number of studies that have shown that if kids are exposed to domestic violence, violence in their home, they're more likely to be both victims and perpetrators at schools. But we also do know from a body of literature that a positive school climate can really create a restorative place for kids that could have a host of uh, risk factors in other environments.